A mysterious beast is lurking in the woods of upstate New York. I know that creature exists. For over 100 years, eyewitnesses claim to have seen an elusive monster. We've cataloged something like 140 to 150 different sightings. That has terrorized the region. I, I was terrified. For the first time ever, MonsterQuest builds a profile of the creature. These are people who have seen something many years ago, and it has stayed with them in their mind. Subjects witnesses, including a police officer, to lie detector tests. It is infallible. And launches an expedition into one of America's most remote habitats. Tracking these animals at night becomes like a game of cat and mouse. Corey, speak to me. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. New York is the epitome of man's evolution, a concrete technological jungle teeming with people and traffic. But away from the sprawling urban metropolis, the town of Whitehall is nestled within six million acres of wild country. Veiled in mystery, for over 100 years, the townsfolk have talked about a towering monster that lives in the surrounding woods. It was close to seven feet tall. It was something I've never seen before. It was too big to be a regular person. The moment I saw it, I, I was terrified. This thing is out there. Eyewitnesses describe a huge bipedal creature weighing approximately 800 pounds. Its face is described as eerily human, with flared nostrils, thin lips, and piercing eyes. The description matches that of the Sasquatch, a legendary creature that looks part man, part ape. Although no physical evidence has ever provided conclusive proof that the creature exists, reported sightings go back hundreds of years. The consistent descriptions are, for some, too similar to discount. This area has a long history of this type of phenomena, and it's very, very much what was reported uh, hundreds of years ago is still reported today. Paul Bartholomew is a local historian and author of two books on the subject. If we look at the historical perspective, we have the reports of the Algonquin and the Iroquois, of the stone giants and the giant men of the mountains, classic reports of the Sasquatch-type creatures. The first recorded account of the Sasquatch living in this region came from the French explorer Samuel de Champlain in the early 1600s. In his diary, he recounts stories as told to him by Native Americans, tales of a giant and hairy human-like creature that lived in the woods. But with a lack of physical, verified photographic or videographic evidence, it is difficult to convince the scientific community of its existence. Every year there are, there are millions of visitors to the Adirondack Park. Ken Kogut is the regional wildlife manager for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. There are also uh, conservation officers, forest rangers, and if there was something out there, uh, it definitely would have been seen. And if the townspeople of Whitehall are seeing anything, Ken says it's most likely a case of mistaken identity. I would say people in, in the Whitehall area who are claiming to see Sasquatch are really seeing uh, probably black bears or, or some other local uh, animal. It's a possible explanation, but more difficult to dismiss are the multiple sightings reported by police officers, men trained in the art of observation and attention to detail. I would not have pulled that revolver unless I was afraid. Dan Gordon is a retired Whitehall Village police officer. On February 15, 1982, Dan was on a routine patrol when he saw something he cannot forget. I was heading north on Route 22 with my partner. And this creature came from the left. I saw it take two steps off the road over the guardrails. I immediately hit the brakes, pulled the car off to the side of the road. I said to my partner, that was some bear, wasn't it? And he said to me, you know that wasn't no bear. Dan immediately left the vehicle, armed himself, and went in for a closer look. 
I could hear the rustling of the brush as it was retreating from me. Now, if I was to say I saw this by myself, I would say, okay, that might possibly be a, an illusion. But I want to ask you why two of us saw the same thing at the same time. Reports like these come as no surprise to this local researcher. Every year there's at least two or three sightings that comes to me. Bill Brand has been investigating local sightings and has monitored the movement and behavior of the creature for more than 30 years. Yeah, Whitehall would certainly be one of the areas to consider a, an expedition or you know a, a study because there's been so much activity in this area for such a long period of time, and there's been multiple sightings seen by multiple witnesses at one time. One of the reasons for that consistency, he believes, is the region's ecology. We're talking about such a vast area through here, you know, this is vast wilderness area. This is basically wilderness area all the way back to the Canadian border. But for many scientists, there is another, more logical explanation for the sightings. There is no evidence for large primates in, in uh, uh, the past several million years in North America. Dr. Phillips Stevens is a professor of cultural anthropology at State University of New York in Buffalo. One of his interests is the study of belief systems, which includes both religion and folklore. There is a class of folkloric belief in hairy, humanoid, or human-like creatures that is reported from every region of the world, living undisturbed in a pristine wilderness. It seems to be universal to the human cognition, the human psyche, to project images of ourselves out into nature. This is called anthropomorphism. There is something fundamentally human going on here. Dr. Stephen's skepticism is shared by the majority of biologists and wildlife researchers, but there are a handful of scientists on the other side of the fence. I look at the Sasquatch as a, an extant North American mammal. Dr. John Bindernagel has over 30 years of field experience and has served as a wildlife advisor for the United Nations. He's been studying the North American Sasquatch since 1975. Well, the Sasquatch is a mythical animal. It, it's very well uh, established in myth and legend. Beavers occur in myth and legend. Killer whales occur, orcas occur in myth and legend. Eagles, many mammals and birds occur in myth and legend, but also occur as real extant mammals. Dr. Bindernagel is in Whitehall to build the first ever profile of the New York Sasquatch. He will examine evidence, interview witnesses, and analyze the region's ecology. While several witnesses agree to a polygraph test to corroborate their claims, and MonsterQuest heads out with Nesra, the Northeastern Sasquatch Research Association, on an expedition for proof. But this investigator doesn't need any convincing that the monster is alive and well in Whitehall. What main, the mainstream skeptics need to do is need to come out there and get out in the field and see what researchers have seen. Steve Culls is a Sasquatch researcher and investigator. He believes that he is closing in on the elusive creature. In August 2003, Steve Culls was contacted by two young boys who had been playing on nearby train tracks. They told him that they heard a hoot, like an owl. But when they looked up, what they saw instead was a huge hairy creature standing on two legs that looked like a gorilla. It stared back at them before disappearing. Steve set out in the direction where the kid said the creature had been headed. So after entering these woods and tracking a very large animal that walked through these woods, it was right here, it seen this impression in the leaves, that I found a 14-inch track. The sheer size and clarity of the footprint left Steve little doubt that he had made an important discovery. But is it proof of a Sasquatch? After examining the photo of the print, researcher Bill Brand seems to think so. You can see the toes, and you can see that the impression where something very heavy has walked through there. Um, everything is matted down, crushed, I think with the, the ruler here, it gives us an exact example of how long this print is. 
So I think we got an excellent example of a, a Sasquatch crop print here in the Northeast. Actually, it's the right size. Steve Cull's track measured 14 inches in length. Dr. John Bindenagel has spent the last 30 years studying evidence like this. He meets up with Steve Culls and Bill Brand to examine tracks that have been documented in the Whitehall region. Yeah, this was cast on uh, November 16th, 2006. The track was actually found about 6.30, and we all thought we had heard some sort of vocalization. And as we're walking back, we had come across this right off to the side of the trail, like something had walked across the trail. And uh, there was a lot of um, leaf litter. So what we did was we cast it, and at that point we, we left for the night. Yeah, it's quite good. Cool. It's interesting, because the toes, I don't know if they were actually gripping, but the, the, if they bent downward, that uh, comes up from time to time in cast. And uh, yeah, the, this, the, the width is so impressive, because Sasquatch tracks are not simply scaled up barefoot human tracks. They, they are proportionately uh, much broader. And, and that certainly shows up here. And often, uh, maximum breadth approaches half of the length, which is considerably broader than, than the human foot. As a wildlife biologist, when we do mammal surveys, we depend heavily on tracks. When tracks are reported, they corroborate that this was actually a physical animal walking you know, across a muddy field or something. Alleged Sasquatch tracks, even when thousands of miles apart, often have the same identifying characteristics. Superficially, the Sasquatch foot looks like an enlarged human foot, and so you, you, we get the name Bigfoot. On closer examination, there are many anatomical differences that, that we see. Which suggests that hoaxers would have to have a shared knowledge of supposed Sasquatch morphology. We now have a large enough collection of track casts that we can, we can look at tracks and determine, I think, pretty accurately if they're valid or not. Dr. John Bindenagel isn't the only researcher determined to prove the existence of the Sasquatch in Whitehall. We would like to get some, some good documentation from a, from a film or video standpoint. Christopher Bartow is a researcher and one of the founding members of NESRA, the Northeast Sasquatch Research Association. This particular area of the Adirondacks outside of Whitehall um, has a particularly rich tradition uh, of sightings going back many years. In October 2007, Christopher Bartow was part of an expedition team here. He heard something approach camp with a growl unlike any creature he'd ever heard. Um, a very bassy, very low frequency growl. And it had a, it had a sort of a gur gurgling sort of resonance to it. In 2005, another Nesra member claimed to have had a sighting in this part of the Adirondacks. And this is also the area where Steve Culls found and cast the 14-inch track in 2006. Nesra has spent the last few months monitoring the region in preparation for this expedition. They have invited Monster Quest to be part of this expedition, but have asked that the exact location be kept confidential. I think that as time has gone by, we've gotten very keen and aware of people playing hoaxes on us. So we're, we're up on that. And that's why there's kind of an air of secrecy of where we're going to be a lot of times or what we're going to do. Steve Culls is a member of NESRA. With many years of field experience behind him and an intimate knowledge of this area, he will lead one of the teams. Team from Nezra setting up for expedition. We're going to be camped uh, 50 yards due east of here. There's going to be teams going out at night uh, patrolling. We're going to be here for the next uh, few days, and uh, hopefully we'll get some action. We're going. We're going to flush this right out of here. Whitehall, New York, has a long history of sightings and encounters with a creature that locals can only describe as a Sasquatch. I still had a hard time believing I had seen such a thing. We've got re a history of reports of this bipedal creature. The idea that such a creature exists in New York State is for some simply unbelievable. It, it just cannot biologically possibly exist. But there are many who disagree. Dr. John Bindenagel is in Whitehall to build, for the first time ever, a possible profile of the creature. 
and Mons de Questus teamed up with Nessera on an expedition into the heart of the creature's habitat. Researcher Steve Culls is checking the area for signs of unusual disturbances and tracks, while Christopher Bartow sets up the first trail camera. Um, you can see up into the surrounding hills here and through a good part of the trees for at least a couple hundred yards in each direction from that point over there. So number one, sound's gonna carry well in this valley. And number two, um, we're gonna be in a fairly decent vantage point to be able to document anything moving through down here. We gotta move out of the area now because when that stops blinking, it's gonna start taking pictures. In New York, we have uh, so much leaf litter and cover that tracks are so hard to come by that when we investigate recent sighting reports uh, in the area, the vicinity of the sightings, we look for fresh breaks in trees. Not so much at this height, which a buck or a bear could easily do, but we look for fresh breaks that are more or less this height or this height, proving that something large has come through here. We've learned from hunters, trappers, and trackers integrated with the technologies of today, such as night vision, thermal imaging, uh, track cameras, live real-time infrared cameras, and uh, the computer technology to help track what's going on and pinpoint where things are going on. Meanwhile, Bill Brand is mapping out the areas that he and Dr. Bindenagel will survey. The summer, midsummer, to into the fall period is where most of the sightings are taking place. This seasonal activity is typical of other large mammals in the area. Seen more frequently in the low grounds in the summer months, they are forced deeper into the forest during the winter in search of food. Bill also believes that Whitehall just happens to be in the middle of the creature's migratory path. As it seems to use these spots more often than others, it's using that area for whatever reason, migration, food source. I believe it's part of the corridor in which this animal travels. While there is no official study to support the migratory habits of Sasquatch, the theory is consistent with the behavior of other large mammals, including bobcats, bears, elk, and coyotes that make use of natural habitat corridors, passageways that allow them to traverse between the best feeding grounds, water sources, and seasonal habitat areas. Why then, with such persistent activity, is there so little physical evidence of the creature here? This type of forest floor here with this heavy layer of pine needles and leaf litter is, is a good example of why Tracks don't register very well in an area like this. A, a soft-footed mammal like a Sasquatch could walk through here and the leaves would spring back and there'd be, there'd be no sign of its passing at all. Pending scientific recognition, John Bindenagel meet up. They set off to survey the area that has had the most sightings. As you know, John, this area has been rich in sightings all around us, actually. But this is where it all began for me, 1976 was really the beginning of what my career as being an investigator in Sasquatch research. The incident that Bill is referring to is a landmark case and one that put the village of Whitehall on the maps of Sasquatch researchers everywhere. I'm definitely a believer. I, I was there. I know what I saw. Brian Gosselin, like Dan Gordon, is a retired Whitehall police officer. In 1976, he also came face to face with a creature he had no explanation for. Well, the night of the sighting was uh, August of 1976. Uh, I was a police officer on duty in Whitehall, New York. And I had two gentlemen pull up to the side of my patrol car, and, and these guys came in saying they had seen some kind of a creature, monster, out on A Bear Road. And they, they were dead serious. I mean, these guys were really wound out. And I drove my, my own car right out into the field. It was a cool night for August, it was crystal clear, dead, dead quiet, and we were talking back and forth once in a while on the CB, and then all of a sudden, I hear Jim holler to me, he says, what the hell is it? He said, I'm he's, Brian, he's, he said, I see something, well, what is it? Jim come tearing out of the field with the patrol car, and he headed back to Whitehall. I listened to this for a few minutes coming across the meadow, 
Not, and, and, and I'm not scared like a child seeing a, the boogeyman, but my, my, my skin was crawling, my hair was standing on it. I knew there was something coming at me, towards me. It wasn't avoiding me. And I got out of the car, and I had the door open, had my 357 in my hand, hammer pulled back, and I flicked that light on, and all I remember seeing was a creature, uh, seven, seven and a half, eight foot tall, 400 pounds, hairy. And when I hit it with the spotlight, it brought hands, not paws, brought hands up and, and covered its face. And I can remember, I, it's etched in my mind, it let out such a blood-curdling, deep-toned screech. Until the 1800s, the sounds and sights of this monster reported by witnesses defied classification. People called it a monster because they had no way to classify it. Primatology had part, well, had not started yet. The gorilla hadn't, wasn't even discovered till 1847. But then, when the, after the gorilla was discovered and it became north in, uh, known in North America, then we had a model and people started using it uh, as a reference, saying, you know, this, this looks like a gorilla, you know. And, and we started, you know, hearing words like ape-like and gorilla-like, and by now, we're, we're quite, some of us at least, are quite confident in classifying it as a great ape, you know, resembling an upright gorilla. Will the Nestra crew and the Monster Quest team finally get the evidence that the world so desperately needs to see? Night has fallen on Whitehall, and the teams are ready. Nestra plans to form a triangle around the area where recent Sasquatch sightings were reported. Steve Culls and fellow researcher Tom Hollywood head up the teams. They will mimic alleged Sasquatch vocalizations in an attempt to pinpoint the creature's location. The methods of vocalizations um, are, are basically trying to make a primate-like sound and throw it out there in hopes that we get a return vocalization purportedly from a sa these Sasquatch creatures. <coughs> Distinguishing vocalizations over the years is acclimating yourself to the sounds of the animals in the particular area you're doing research in. Okay, I'm gonna do a moan howl in about 20 seconds from now. Steve to base camp. Go ahead, Steve. Um, I don't know if um, Hollywood did uh, one whoop or one howl, but uh, I've heard two so far. Uh, no, Steve. Uh, I think he only did it once. Yeah, I thought that was Hollywood. I just heard one about maybe 25, 30 seconds ago. Hey, Hollywood, how many times did you uh, vocalize there? You said you were going to wait 20 seconds. We had one, like, right after your first transmission. No, that wasn't me. I just howled once. OK, that one was Hollywood. The one before that, um, we thought it was you. That's negative. <laughs> I thought that was Hollywood, and then we waited, and then I heard a second one. The response that Steve claims to have heard is not picked up on tape. He describes it as very faint. Then. Steve hears something rustling in the bushes. I got movement up behind me on the hill. Something pulled this down. Looks like something pulled this down. The townsfolk of Whitehall, New York are being stalked by a monster who has haunted the local woods for centuries. Wildlife biologist Dr. John Bindernagel is here to investigate the phenomena. And Nessra, the Northeast Sasquatch Research Association, is on an expedition in search of the ultimate evidence. It will probably be a body that can be cross-referenced and, and uh, cataloged. And for many in the scientific community, that is exactly what it will take. People have asked, what kind of evidence would I need to, to make, you know, to convince me as the wildlife manager that Sasquatch exists here in Whitehall. And that's probably going to be a dead Sasquatch that, that's going to make me, con convince me that there is this animal. Otherwise, I'm always going to be a skeptic. 
But without a body, what will it take to convince the world the Sasquatch is here in this remote region? I think the simplest answer is actually just to verify the truth. Alan Hills is a private investigator and a recognized polygraph expert. He has been retained independently by MonsterQuest. We like to call the polygraph a truth verifier as opposed to a lie detector. So a polygraph is a scientific instrument. And with the right training and the right individual, it is very, very accurate, absolutely accurate. For most of the witnesses who claim to have seen the creature, their encounters have left them questioning themselves. Did they really see a monster? I was very scared. The moment I saw it, I, I was terrified. Sue Ross was eight years old when she saw the creature. My brother and I were playing in a shale pit down the road from where we lived, um, a few hundred feet away. And uh, we were walking back home, and um, I kept getting hit with these little pebbles in the, on my right shoulder. And I thought it was my brother, and I you know, said to my brother, stop throwing stones at me. And he, you know, I'm not throwing stones at you. But Sue felt several more pebbles hit her before she turned round to her brother. He raised his hands and again swore that he hadn't thrown anything. Right at that moment, I'm facing him, and um, a stone hit me in my forehead coming from the woods to my left. And I turned and looked, and there was this creature standing there and throwing pebbles. Terrified. Sue and her brother ran home. You know, I got home and told my mother what happened. I was crying, and at eight years old, I described it as a monster. I, I was terrified. All these years, I kind of wondered, you know, maybe it wasn't what I thought I saw. I've had doubts, a, a lot of doubts. These are people who have seen something many years ago, and it has stayed with them in their mind. Do you know for sure that the creature you saw was not human? Yes. Could you now take me to the exact spot where you saw Bigfoot? Yes. Could you have imagined seeing a creature described as Bigfoot? No. According to Dr. Philip Stevens, the imagination is a more likely place for a Sasquatch to live than New York State. The fact that people all over the world are, re are seeing similar creatures suggests very strongly, not weakly, very strongly now, that this is something that people do, something that the human mind does. But for Dr. John Bindenagel, these collective reports that are similar in description are critical when building an anatomical profile of the creature. Fortunately, some people who see Sasquatches don't just describe them, but they actually make an attempt to draw them. And these eyewitness drawings are especially helpful because people will often see something or remember something as they make a drawing that they may have forgotten in their, in their verbal description. In this one, for example, we, we, the muscularity of, of, the, of the Sasquatch is, is very, very evident and the, and the short, thick neck. Some are described as females, either because of visible breasts or because it, it was apparently carrying an infant. And uh, that's always of interest. And then yet others seem to be uh, young adults or what we call sub-adults. Variations in size and gender definitely supports the argument that in order for the Sasquatch to thrive in Whitehall, there would have to be a breeding population. The sizes may vary. Uh, you may have a report in one area where the creature's five foot tall and in another area where it's seven feet tall. But this would be normal as a creature would grow. It's very consistent with a living, breathing, biological creature. But for those who are doubtful of the creature's existence, this idea simply fuels their skepticism. To say that there is a breeding, surviving population that goes on and, and definitely is, is just a, a fantasy. Claimants say that these things can exist uh, undetected, and uh, I'm just, we're just looking at reasons why this is unlikely rather than impossible. And the village and town board of Whitehall may not think it's impossible. In January 2004, Paul Bartholomew lobbied for legislation to protect the Sasquatch and won.
Whitehall is, is a protective habitat of the Sasquatch because we've established such a history for the creature in this area. In February 2004, the board passed legislation for a Sasquatch protective ordinance. It reads, whereas the possibility of all endangered species proven and pending scientific recognition should be entitled to protection under the federal and New York state laws. The legislation supports Nasser's belief that the creature exists in this part of the country. The Nesra team chased the strange noise for more than a mile before the trail went cold. Well, what happened was one of our guys from another team was gonna commence throwing out a vocalization in 20 seconds. Then all of a sudden, something vocalized. They'll try vocalizing again in the hopes of picking up the trail once more. Once we get vocalizations, then we can perhaps understand that there's maybe a creature out there. So that kind of pinpoints the location of where this creature may be, or in some cases to, to actually go in and seek it out or draw it in. And that's exactly what Steve and the other Nesra members hope to do. I'm gonna try uh, a few calls out here. Approximately south of your location, about 400 yards. Yeah, go ahead and start your stuff. A large thump or wood knock of some kind. We just wanted to know if that was you. That's negative. Despite its elusiveness, has Nestra managed to pick up the trail again? Corey, speak to me. Whitehall, New York is rich in biology, history, and folklore. It would appear to be the ideal environment for a creature that purportedly came here millions of years ago and took up residence in local mythology, woodlands, and parks. Dr. John Bindernagel is interviewing key eyewitnesses who claim to have seen the monster of Whitehall. For some, it has changed their lives. This man was 18 when he encountered a creature he had no name for. For the first time, he tells his story to John Bindernagel. He is asked to remain anonymous. It was back in about 1981, January. A uh, very cold night, very clear night. I was out there with a friend, and uh, we were sitting there talking. And out of the corner of my eye, I noticed motion in a hay field off to my right. I'm saying, it must be a cross-country skier. But as I look at it, it's not moving like a cross-country skier. The gait is like a walk, but the speed is like a run. As it's approaching us, I can see it clearly silhouetted against the white hay field. It's a large, shaggy man, as far as I know. And that was the point where I got up and got out of the car. I shut the car door after I got out. And when I did that, whatever it was, seemed to notice the sound of the car door. And I'm still looking at it, still trying to figure it out. And the person with me was becoming quite upset. I did get into the vehicle, and uh, we departed post haste. The intellectual discord there between what you know to be real and what you know can't be real right. was uh, very distinct and very disturbing. Witness accounts are not the only reports that are called into question. One of the biggest problems I've come to realize is that almost half the scientific community will not examine evidence if there's no theoretical basis for that evidence. Scientists want a theory. And the best theory is the Gigantopithecus theory. A fossil ape of Asia may have migrated across the Bering Land Bridge along with mastodons, the giant beaver, bison, a number of mammals, including humans, which came to North America across that land bridge and, and persists either as the Sasquatch as Gigantopithecus or as a close relative or descendant. Theories have abounded over the years surrounding the mystery creature of Whitehall. For the first time ever, eyewitnesses take a polygraph test to prove to the rest of the world what they believe they saw. I do not determine your uh, truthfulness or whether you're lying until the entire test is finished, all the interview process, polygraph itself, then I analyze the results and I determine beyond a doubt for my satisfaction whether or not you're truthful. On or about January 15th, 1981 at approximately midnight, did you see a creature you would describe as Bigfoot? Yes. 
Could you now take me to the exact spot where you saw Bigfoot? Yes. Could you have imagined seeing a creature described as Bigfoot? No. Despite the fact that the eyewitness accounts span two decades, each person has given a similar response. The caliber of the person who's telling the story, you've got law officers which are trained observers. This is something there, there's no doubt about it. It was dark, it looked hairy, it was eight to nine feet tall. Crystal Austin was walking her friend Melissa Gordon and Don Juck at home one evening when they encountered a nine foot monster. We were walking over one of the hills and standing in front of us was a large figure. It looked hairy, dark colored, brown. It was about nine feet tall. All I seen was like the black outline of it. It was standing on two feet with its arms just like hanging down straight. And like my heart just started beating. We screamed, we ran up the hill and looked back and it was gone. Around 20 miles away from where the girls came face to face with the monster, the Nessra expedition team believes that they are hot on the trail of the creature. The events of the evening have them on high alert. There's been a lot of aggressive behavior in certain parts of this park. Escorts, screaming vocalizations, and now object throwing. So what the hell happened up there? I was on the left hill. There's a little, a little dip between us. He's on the right hill. I thought I heard something moving around on the top of the hill couple, like two, three pine cones came over the top. I'm assuming our sticks or something. And then the last one got me in the back of the head. OK, we're having movement now. Uh, you guys heard it. We heard it. We're having a tremendous amount of activity up this way. Could this be the break that Nezra has been waiting for? Speak to me. The woods have fallen silent. Whatever was out there has gone. And what happened is we lost the trailhead down there coming back because everything is just knocked down in there. And this type of the lighting, even with the lighting we use, you can't tell which trail and what's not. Steve Culls and the rest of the Nesra team head back to base camp. Although they didn't manage to catch sight of the creature tonight, perhaps the trail cameras did. Tracking these animals at night becomes like a game of cat and mouse. They have the tactical advantage. What generally runs through my head is, did we tape it? But it is too dark tonight, and they'll have to wait until tomorrow to find out. While Dr. John Bindenagel finalizes his report, Alan Hills completes the final polygraph analysis. One question can be asked numerous times, and each time it's answered, you'll think you're answering it the same way. But your eyes will be different, your gesture may be different, your tone of voice may be different. Yes. All these are part of exactly what's going on inside your head. And they need to be analyzed properly by a professional. Could the test yield a shocking verdict on the existence of the creature? Is the creature of Whitehall a Sasquatch, a legendary monster that is part man, part ape? Or are the townsfolk simply mistaking it for other animals native to the region? This retired police officer came face to face with the monster. This man's encounter has haunted him for 20 years. This man has dedicated 30 years of his life trying to prove the existence of the Whitehall Sasquatch. And this man believes it's only a matter of time before mainstream science is forced to accept the creature as a living, breathing mammal. With more than 150 sightings in Whitehall, 
only a handful of scientists accept these claims. If there is a population of these creatures, as there very well as, as there must be, if we're going to see any at all, they've got they've got to have moms and dads, right? And and uh, presumably they want to reproduce themselves. There must be others, and there must be a significant number of others. Where where are they? While Christopher Barto sets off to check the camera traps from last night's chase. Ex-state police detective and polygraph expert Alan Hills reveals his findings. I am 100% objective in the beginning. I must be trained to be, and I am. I think that without the element of objectivity, I'm really useless. If I'm convinced at the beginning someone is lying, I'll find them lying. And if I'm convinced someone is telling the truth, I'll find them truthful. So if I'm not going to be 100% objective, white test. These are people who have seen something many years ago, and it has stayed with them in their mind. Can science say without a shadow of a doubt that the eyewitnesses of Whitehall are truthful in their testimony? The, the simple fact is that, in my opinion, they were not lying about anything. For the residents of Whitehall, the conclusive results of the polygraph testing is evidence of multiple sightings. I can believe myself. I was afraid some people would look at me and be skeptical. But thanks to this program, I think we can put that to rest. What the polygraph did for me personally was let me know that um, I hadn't created in my mind a truth uh, that wasn't the truth. Is Dr. John Bindernagel's report as conclusive? Well, you know, for, c coming from my position as, as, as one of the handful of scientists that does accept the Sasquatch as an extant mammal, you know, and being aware of, of Whitehall, New York, and upstate New York reports, you know, I, I didn't come here perhaps with the skepticism that some people would have. Nevertheless, I really did want to hear for myself eyewitness accounts and see some of the evidence, which, which I have done, which I was able to experience. And, I, you know, I, I'm totally convinced uh, that, that the Sasquatch does exist here in upstate New York. There, there's no doubt about it in my mind. And the eyewitnesses who shared their accounts, you know, help, help with that conviction. The Sasquatch phenomenon is a fascinating uh, controversy, scientific controversy. So it's, it's very, very interesting to begin with. And in, then to have reports, uh, very credible reports coming from literally our, our own backyard in a sense in the White Hall area. Uh, that becomes almost intoxicating. You, you just can't uh, ignore that type of report. And now we have police officers, uh, very respectable uh, people in the region that had sightings. So it's very credible, it's very interesting, and whatever's going on here, it's, it's consistent with what's going on throughout the country and throughout the world. The investigation into the monster of Whitehall is revealing startling results, but did the Nesra team manage to capture any photographic evidence? On this occasion, the images reveal nothing unusual, a disappointment to the Nesra crew, perhaps, but not the end. With the intense activity over the last few days, they are now even more convinced that Whitehall holds the key to the mystery. What the truthful witnesses are telling me is the same thing, how these creatures act, what they look like, what they sound like, what they smell like. That, to me, says volumes about the validity of this creature. In terms of what, what's the next level of research, how can we improve in what we do? Um, you know, certainly we'd like to provide the base evidence that will help science get on board. People around the world have been chasing the shadow of Sasquatch for centuries, and the monster of Whitehall seems no less elusive. But Monster Quest examination has proved something, that the people of Whitehall are telling the truth about what they saw. This is a living creature in our woods. There was no doubt of what I saw. Now I know they're there. And that Whitehall could both support and conceal a population of Sasquatch. People are quite resistant to the idea that the Sasquatch could be in, in New York State, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, but it is. For the rest of us, the mystery will continue until the much needed evidence is presented. I think overall, um, 
the scientific community is, is, is starting to slowly come around to the idea that there may be more going on in the woods in North America than meets the eye. Large creatures may be prowling the mountains of California. Two creatures I saw could not have been more than a yard apart, and they were definitely there together. Elusive. These beasts are easily spooked. And they start thrashing and screaming and throwing rocks at you. Strange tracks may indicate a breeding population. So this is about three days old footprint right there. New evidence is coming to light. So you can see the subject moving from right to left. Now Monster Quest takes up the search, looking for evidence of the Sierra Sasquatch. I'm starting to hear something. Oh, this is pretty weird. Hi, me. Do you read me? People around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. The Sierra Nevada. This 400-mile mountain range straddles the border of California and Nevada. The area is filled with wildlife, including the bighorn sheep and black bear. But lurking in this alpine wilderness may be a family of beasts that strikes fear in all who encounter it. It was at least uh, seven foot tall as it stood up. Very lean, very muscular. These were big things. These were big beings. Whatever it was, it traveled quite a long distance. I do think they're walking together as a group or a family unit. Eyewitnesses describe seeing giant hairy beasts that roam the Sierras in family groups. They range from seven to nine feet tall and are thought to weigh anywhere from 500 to 800 pounds. The animal's hair is dark black in the younger animals to brown in adults. All of the creatures have piercing red eyes and are known as Sasquatch. The one thing I can't get out of my mind was the night we were on patrol and we were waiting to be ambushed. Butch Young was only 19 when he was sent to the Marine Mountain Warfare Training Center near Mono Lake, California. They sent us there to learn how to fight, how to conduct combat, how to uh, survive and make war and meet the enemy head on in a mountainous environment. Young thought he was prepared for the remote wilderness location. The training center was extremely remote. At night, you would hear absolutely nothing. There was no sound of cars. There was no planes really going over it. One night, Young and his squad were on patrol during a nighttime war game. It was cold, and we were probably around seven, 8,000 feet. There was snow on the ground, the moon was out, and you could see quite clearly. The men spotted what they thought was an opposing squad. As I looked off to my right, moving through was two figures in the trees. One of them was standing, the other one was kind of crouched. But the pair did not act like Marines on maneuvers. They were defying all logic about how a Marine should be in the woods trying to cover and conceal himself. It just didn't make any sense. Confused, the squad strained to get a better look. And I was looking for any sign that this might be Marines. I was looking for a weapon. I was looking for the edges of uniforms. I just remember the moon being able to light them up just enough to where I could see the one's fingers. To be able to distinguish that from 25 to 35 yards away, that had to be a pretty big hand. It wasn't until later that the Marines realized what they'd seen. The next morning, we found out that the aggressor squad was two clicks away. They weren't even in the neighborhood. They were nowhere near us. So we were wondering what we saw, who was up there in the tree line. Well, maybe it was a Bigfoot. Maybe we actually saw a Bigfoot. The Sierra Nevada region has long been the location of Sasquatch sightings, and dozens of strange tracks have been found here. 
but there are some who are unconvinced that the area is inhabited by a Sasquatch family. I'm skeptical about them being Sasquatch because we don't have any definitive signs in the tracks that would separate them from human tracks. John Mayanzinski is a wildlife biologist. He believes that the tracks were made by a known animal. It's possible that these are young Sasquatch, but I would think that young Sasquatch would avoid people just like uh, old Sasquatch do. The sightings have persisted near Mono Lake, located 185 miles east of San Francisco. Monster Quest will start its search for the legendary creature here. They will search the area using infrared aerial and ground surveillance cameras. The science team will analyze video thought to be a Sasquatch. Finally, they'll examine the evidence that families of Sasquatch live here. Anthropologist Dr. Jeff Meldrum will lead the expedition. He'll be guided by Jaime Avalos, who has tracked Sasquatch in the area for years. The fact that Jaime has found multiple individuals in concert of different sizes but of a moderate uh, foot length is really quite intriguing. By far the majority of reports of sightings as well as footprint discoveries involve a single individual. I'm finding them going into the same areas about the same time of the year for about the past two years. So I can go to an area at a certain time and find tracks in these areas now that I've established a corridor of movement. Avalos believes a family of Sasquatch is traveling together because of the varying size of prints he has found. I've pulled up some that are 11 inches, 10 inches, and eight inches, younger juveniles, most likely based on the size of the, of the tracks. The team's plan is to examine the existing evidence, including the footprint casts assess whether the habitat of the area could support a large primate, and then attempt to track down the creatures. Well, did you guys have a good trip? Yes, we did, sir. How are you? Fernando. Roger, Bruce, sir. Fernando, nice to meet you. You're the tracker. Yes, sir, I am. I want to get my cuff out of here and we'll tape this on. This is the thermal imaging camera. We're going to mount it on the wing. The team believes that the Sasquatch can easily be frightened by noise, so they've decided to use a glider to survey the area. The thermal camera on the wing will pick up the heat signatures of animals moving below. The aircraft has a small engine that is used to climb to gliding altitude, then shuts off, and the glider soars in total silence, undetected from the ground. Yeah. All right, you guys, we'll finish with this uh, cuff. Our camera's all set. We're going to make a pass at 500 feet, see what your thermal image looks like. And then I'm going to do one at 1,000 feet, one 1,500 feet, and maybe get some sound readings about how loud I am so that we get an idea of what uh, the Sasquatch would, would hear. And I'm going to fire this thing up, so we probably should have you clear out here. The test flight will enable them to calibrate the thermal camera. Clear prop. <laughs> Okay, we've got full power. Levine traffic, uh, experimental to Tango Tango. We're doing some sound tests. I'll be turning a right face, making a 500 foot flow pass over Levine. I'm gonna make a pass at about 1,000 feet over the runway. I'm gonna continue and make my next pass at 1,500 feet above the runway. For the third pass, the engine is turned off to begin gliding. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and go into my stealth mode. I'm gonna be shutting my prop down. Uh, we're gonna do that right now. Levine traffic to Tango Tango. I should be over the numbers 1-5 right now at 1,500 feet above the ground. At this altitude, it is impossible to see or hear the glider from the ground. Perfect for stealth surveillance. But the high winds are causing problems. I think we've lost our tape. A cable has ripped loose, ruining the thermal image of the ground. We're getting a fair amount of turbulence here. 
I'm gonna go ahead and just take it in it. The pilot decides to land. I'm on about a 10 mile final approach for 3 3 b binding and we've got some tape coming loose. Monster Quest is searching the mountains of California for the Sierra Sasquatch a beast that may live in groups or families. The earliest sightings in this area are part of Native American legend. The Shoshone tell of the Jarbidge, a giant hairy man-eater. The Jarbidge, or hairy devil, was thought to prey on those who wandered away from the tribe. It was said to carry off its victims, leaving only large footprints behind. Drawings of these prints mixed in with those of other native animals may be found on the rocks of the Sierra Nevada. The presence of, of footprints as represented by any hunter-gatherer society represents their familiarity with the animal life that is present in, the, in, their, in their world. The shape and placement are significant in identifying the Sasquatch prints in the carvings. The representation of five-toed plantigrade, that is flat-footed footprints, which are uh, quite distinct from the typical representation of a human foot. This uh, one foot placed in directly in front of the other is interesting, and they do stand out from all the other more familiar wildlife tracks that are represented so often in these petroglyphs. And now, new evidence has come to light, which may show the Sasquatch. And when I saw it on there, I was like stunned. The hair literally went up on the back of my neck. The man who shot this video is concerned about his family's privacy and has asked Monster Quest to obscure his identity. We just took a day trip out to Monolink just to see the lake and just, you know, catch the sights. So we drove out and parked the car and took a walk down to the lake. I had my home video camera with me. I was basically shooting the scenery around the lake, shooting the tufa, shooting the lake, shooting my family. But something was lurking nearby. The rock formations are really pretty spectacular. And then Sierra Nevada mountains on one side and then the White Mountain Range on the other side. That area was just spectacular, it's beautiful. Here we are at Mono Lake on Saturday morning, first day of our vacation. I was shooting the panorama, basically. I was not out looking for anything. It was really cold, it was really windy, and we just uh, ended up packing it up about a, probably about an hour later and went home. The tape was forgotten for 17 years, until one day when a family member played it and noticed something out of the ordinary. The hair literally went back up on the back of my neck. Here was this thing that was down there, some kind of creature that was down right where my kids were, right on the beach right there. And so it was a little bit unnerving. If I would have turned it off a second or two sooner, I probably never would have caught it. Uh, to me, it's still inconclusive. It's a mystery to me. I don't, I don't think it's a bear. I don't think it's a person. I don't know. The science team will analyze the video. Forensic analyst Greg Stutchman has traveled to Mono Lake, where the recording was made. He will collect data to determine the size of the creature. The video was recorded in 1991. Since the footage was shot, the water level has risen seven feet, partially submerging the rock formations seen in the original video. The team is forced to search the 16 miles of coastline for the filming location a panoramic image created from multiple frames of the video will help locate the site. Hey, Steve, come on over. I think I may have found it. Hey, what'd you find? They use the mountains in the background as a reference point. Let's get our measuring equipment and do the complete photogrammetry analysis. To calculate the height of the creature in the video, 
they must determine the dimensions of the rock formations. Okay. The first step is to photograph them using known focal lengths. Hold it right there again. Put this right out to it. Then they measure the distance of the camera to the waterline and the vertical height of the waterline to the center of the camera's lens. 87 inches. Okay, that's it. Okay. The last step is to use a laser measuring device to determine the distance from the camera to the rock formation. The science team now has the data they need to begin the analysis back at their lab. Jaime Avalos believes that the tracks he has documented around Mono Lake were made by the creature. He has traveled to an area near the sighting location. He'll be installing a PIX controller surveillance camera developed for law enforcement agencies to monitor large areas. Avalos believes the creatures are familiar with him, so he hikes in alone to set up the camera. I think the creature might be comfortable with me just because of the approach that I'm taking. It's a respectful observation. He finds fresh deer scat just below the snow line. This is the elevation where he suspects the Sasquatch may be hunting. Avalo soon finds a good place to deploy the camera. The system has wireless motion sensors and can be buried, making it virtually invisible. Jaime sets up the camera, motion sensors, and infrared light source, then buries the recorder. Okay. The team prepares to carry out its aerial search. This is the airport right here. This is the canyon that I'm talking about. There's been previous activity before, and this is actually an area of projection. You're not going to have a big area that you're going to have to look at. Once we start the thermal cameras, they'll just I'll, I'll cover the whole area. So we can also come down this way and then come towards the Chew Lake area. The tip of this lake, I'm going to put my spoilers out, and I'm going to just circle around and drop several thousand feet to the lake level. If I see something, I'll probably swing out here a ways, climb way back up several thousand feet. And they won't even be aware of me at all. Let's go ahead and do this. All right, oh, let's go. both tanks. We've actually got uh, 18 gallons of gas. That's six or seven hours of flight. The rest of the team follows the glider from the ground. To Tango Tango, can you please advise on your current position? We're going to head on down to June Lake and we'll have our search cameras out going all the distance. Roger that. The throttle back now. Kind of just go into a gliding mode here. Suddenly, the camera detects a heat source. We're picking up a little hot spot here just south of the, the little lake there. OK, we'll go on up and take a look on the, on the ground. The heat signature is near June Lake, one of the areas they have targeted. The ground team arrives where the hot spot appeared and searches for evidence of the beast. There has been a lot of deer came in through this area to drink water in and out. This is where the predators hang out because Definitely. they know they're going to come down and they're going to have to get a drink of water. Look at this one. This is actually a bear. This is a big bear. Yeah, he okay. is. This area has been teeming with animals that could be prey for the Sasquatch. Also, we have a raccoon, and we also have a deer, and also one a, a duck. So you have a lot of animal activity up here, this area, in and out, in and out. Come over up here and drink water right there. The animal activity is encouraging, but 
that a storm is approaching. Okay, what do we have here? It's like the 11 by 5 again. The fresh track has the same dimensions as those found by Avalos in the past. Water's starting to come up, so we're going to have to do this sure. quick. They need to make a cast before the storm washes away the tracks. This wind is just really blowing me around. OK. Excellent. They'll need to analyze the print. There could be further proof. So I'm just going to let it fill in itself. We'll give it a second here. MonsterQuest has traveled to the Sierra Nevada mountains, where a family of Sasquatch may be preying on the local wildlife population. It could have ripped my door off, and there wouldn't have been a thing I could have done about it. Jaime Avalos was driving in the mountains 30 miles southwest of Mono Lake, when he saw something shocking. When I had come down this hill, I had seen this creature cross the road. I really wasn't sure what it was. The first thing that came to my mind was, you know, what the heck is a guy in a gorilla suit doing up at this elevation? I started pulling up forward again. And then it came back. As the sun shined onto it, I could see the changes of the muscles moving underneath of the fur. Avalos estimated the creature to be at least seven feet tall. I knew it could be next to my vehicle within a minute. It would have ripped my locked door from my truck, extracted me from my vehicle, and there wouldn't have been a damn thing I could have done about it. Avalos was so shaken by the encounter that he has searched for the creature ever since. Well, I've been finding multiple tracks for a couple of years now, and they all seem to be from the same group, whether it's on the eastern side of the Sierras or whether it's on the western side of the Sierras, and I've been tracking them for over 400 miles. The Monster Quest team has found tracks that are similar to what Avalos has seen, and they follow them to their source. Fernando Moreira is a professional tracker. He was trained by the Portuguese Special Forces and fought wars in both Angola and Mozambique. If you're not real good and, and you make one little mistake, you can get your whole entire team killed or you, even yourself. Dr. Jeff Meldrum will test Moreira's tracking skills. We'll make it uh, simple here to begin with and then Maybe mix it up a bit. The varied terrain will make tracking difficult. I'll tell you this, that anyone who's faking bare footprints through this kind of environment would have to have spent more time out of shoe wear than I obviously have. That's about all I can do. Morera is called back and begins to read the overturned rocks and compacted soil with astounding precision. The good tracker should be able to follow the set of footprints all the way to the end of it. Morera is able to trace the route exactly, even identifying the spot where Meldrum briefly sat down to change his shoes. So this object actually sit down right here, whatever it was, change shoes, okay, from the barefoot, put his shoes on it, and he's walking out. Even if a Sasquatch has the intelligence to try and conceal its tracks, Morera would still be able to track it. Well, I'm really, truly impressed, Fernando. I, uh, the fact that, that I was able to march out this uh, in your absence, and yet you were still able to pick up uh, all those details, even in the varied terrain. So you, you nailed the course really well. Clear prop. The team resumes the aerial surveillance. But strong winds make flying dangerous. Whoa. Okay, well, we're, we're getting wind coming down off that ridge and kind of pushing us down, and that's why we're getting a few more bumps now. The original plan to fly into Lundy Lake Canyon is quickly changed. With this much turbulence, I'm leery of going in that canyon. OK. 
Okay, let us know. The pilot attempts to fly towards the mountains, but the winds are too strong and he is forced to retreat. I always have an out, even if there's a downdraft, we have an extra several thousand feet below us that we can just ride it out. We'll be landing in about uh, five minutes. Okay, check back in with us when we get there. The high winds mean that the ground team will be without air support. The searching location where Avalos found tracks in 2008. Hopefully we can find something down this way. Something here. This one right there, right? Right. So I'm gonna mark it all the way around here. Yeah. Let's go ahead and measure this. Okay, so this is looking like about a nine by four track. This isn't really what I've been picking up most of the time. The track appears to be a human print, so the team moves on. Meldrum and Mayanzinski begin to evaluate the surrounding habitat to determine if it could support a Sasquatch population. I'm going to be looking for meat sources. There's been a lot of reports of deer and elk being used as food by Sasquatch. Those are anecdotal stories, of course, but we have found some evidence that uh, they do use those things in some areas. But vegetation is more of a key to all of that because you don't find deer where there isn't deer food. Habitat's a combination of food and cover. This is really not prime habitat right where we're standing. They examine the food sources at a higher elevation, which might be more suitable for a large primate. Coming up from the lake, we're in a little better habitat here. We've got all these Jeffrey pines right here. This is probably one of the most productive sources of protein we can find. Right. Here's one that's dropping its seeds all over. The find makes Mayanzinski optimistic about the suitability of the habitat. These are a complete protein for humans. It's not outrageous to think that a large primate of that size can actually get most of its protein from these pines that grow right here. Other animals are known to follow the ripening of pine cones. At different elevations, you have a different time when these nuts become available. By knowing where these are and being able to plot these on vegetation zones on a map, we can, to some extent, predict where we should expect to find an omnivorous primate here. You find bears moving right to those places at exactly the right time within a day or so. Much like bears who teach their young to return to recurring food sources, a family of Sasquatch could be following this food trail. The young learn it from their mothers generally, in the case of bears, and often it has to be a quick movement right. because birds also feed on uh, pine nuts. Right. They also feed on the same berries that omnivores feed on. I think uh, we need to look at some other places to find a good combination of cover and uh, food sources. The large trout found in this lake could be another possible food source. And the team spots more bizarre marks in the sand. This looks interesting okay. here. And this one is actually a good footprint. You can see one, two, three, four, five. Five little yep. toes right there in this area. And there's a large footprint. This is another one. And look at right there too. You see yeah. where the hill is pointing? Pointing this way. Look away, the toe is pointing right there, and you have this disturbance here. And actually, even have the drag marks here, right? Yeah. So you know what these drag marks are? It's from a kayak or a sailing boat Coming that the person way, yeah. come out, out of the water. Then you can see that everything's already completely dry, and there's actually these rocks is actually frozen in place. So this is about three days old footprint right there. Monster Quest is investigating reports of a family of Sasquatch that have been seen in the Sierra Nevada mountains near the Nevada-California border. I didn't have a tag for this creature, wherever it was, so I wasn't about to shoot him. In 2005, Joe Walls was hunting for deer in a remote area. It's about 8.30 in the morning. As I went up on top of this ridge line, I started walking south on it. After traveling for about an hour and a half, I was pretty well tired. And I said, well, I'm going to sit down here and take a break for about a half an hour before I head back to camp. But Walls wasn't alone. 
At about 11.15, I said, well, I better get going again. It's getting late. I need to get back to camp. When I went and leaned over to grab my rifle, as soon as I touched that, I noticed movement behind this tree. This creature walked out in front of me, and we had really good eye contact, and this creature had red eyes, but it had disappeared into the wood line. The beast rushed off with surprising speed, but then two others appeared. At that time, I noticed there was more movement to my left. I do think they were walking together as a family unit. These were definitely not uh, human beings dressed up in any type of costume. Uh, it was hunting season. Um, they would definitely be taking their lives in their hands walking around with uh, monkey suits on in the mountains. The two creatures then disappeared in the same direction as the first. I start getting kind of nervous and I start getting that feeling like maybe I better get out of this area and get back to camp. When I walk in the woods now, I'm looking around me all the time. I'm very wary of my surroundings now, probably where I never was before. This video was shot at Mono Lake, not far from where other sightings were reported. The Stutchman Forensics Lab in Napa Valley, California, is analyzing the footage. So this is the copy of the original video that I received from the eyewitness. The science team is attempting to sharpen and enhance the video image, looking for details that might reveal the creature's identity. The low quality of the video is presenting a problem. We use a dedicated forensic software system um, that is typically used in my field for video enhancement. In this case, it doesn't help us very much because we're dealing with a limited number of pixels and resolution. The information is not there from the beginning, so if you don't have it in the original format, you're not going to be able to create it when zooming in or, or sharpening. They stabilize the image so that only the creature is moving. This is the stabilized movie. So you can see the subject moving from right to left, right here. The background is stabilized, and the camera view is moving around. Only one step remains. This is the final product, the stabilized image that's been cropped, so your eye can focus on just what's happening here and not any other distractions. From my portion of the video analysis, I can't tell 100% if that's a human or if it's a Sasquatch. But the image stabilization has already solved one mystery. This is what caught my eye in the beginning, is this kind of a foot or something right here. And some people think that there's a sleeve. In the stabilized view, you can see that there's a rock or a bush or something in the foreground that blocks the view of that. It appears the figure is not simply a man in disguise. The work is given to senior analyst Greg Stutchman. Greg will be able to use still photos captured from this video to calculate the height of the subject based on known dimensions at the scene. The expedition team is looking for groups of tracks. Dr. Jeff Meldrum is leading the hunt in an area near Lundy Lake Canyon, away from the usual recreation areas. We're well done on the fire, John. So I think it's uh, time for us to go ahead and try that solo camera system that I'm going to take with me mm -hmm. and head up into the ca canyon. Um, you guys will be able to uh, monitor my progress as we move along. Jaime Avalos will try to make contact with the creatures alone. But before he sets off, he masks his scent with smoke. The cameras he will use include a Buckeye wireless system that records night vision images from two perspectives and transmits live video. Yeah, I think we're set to go. Jaime, why don't you go ahead and take off? I think we're ready to send. I'm here, I'm heading out. Good luck. Avalo sets off into the darkness. Meldrum will monitor his progress. Six bars, though, good signal. So, Jaime, how far do you think you are from base camp now? Copy that. He continues on up the canyon, attempting to elicit a response from the creatures. I'm gonna start here and uh, do a little whistling. Copy that. 
Avalos heads deeper into the wilderness. I'm really getting into a really dark area. I don't know if I'm getting that weird feeling or getting that. Just give me a minute on that one. It's pretty smoky up here all in the dark. He continues his journey not far from the location where he's seen the creature. I think I'm here along the lake right now. Looks like your signal's diminished to about 50% at this point. Still recording your uh, transmission, however. Avlos is nearing the limits of his video and radio transmitters. 30%. You're down to 30%. Are you hearing any responses in reaction to your whistling? I'm starting to hear something. It sounds like a baby cat. I'm picking up a little bit of noise to the left of me. I'm pointing the camera in that direction. Your signal's breaking up. We're getting basically just static at this point. Can you repeat your last? You're really breaking up. I think we've lost the signal. Oh, this is pretty weird here. Avalos' signal is gone. Hi, Amy, do you read me? Monster Quest is searching for a group of Sasquatch that witnesses have encountered in the Sierra Nevada mountains. This man has been collecting evidence that he believes proves the beast's existence. This video analyst is examining evidence to identify the monster. And this man came face to face with three of the creatures while hunting in the mountains. The expedition team is conducting a search of the area and has heard strange cries. During the night, they have lost contact with a team member who was scouting a location said to be inhabited by Sasquatch. Try to call him again. Hi, me. Do you read me over? Finally, Avalos emerges over a nearby hill. He searched the area, but was unable to find what was making the sounds. The strange cry was not picked up by the team's recording devices, so they cannot analyze or identify what Avalos heard. The team regroups in the morning to examine the prints they cast by the lake and to compare them to tracks Avalos has found in the past. They focus on three specific size groups. All right. This is it. This is it. So what I have here are representatives of the 11, the 10, and the 8 on the west side of the Sierras as well as the east side of the Sierras. So go ahead and take a look and you can flip them over and you'll see time, date, and elevations of each of these as well as sizes. And those seem to be fairly consistent over the past two and a half years? Yeah, pretty much. I always seem to find all three of the same. The repetition of these three distinct tracks has led Avalos to believe he has been following the same group of Sasquatch for more than two years. Well, there's no question in my mind that you're finding the footprints repeatedly of just a small selection of individuals. They determine the cast taken on this trip is a match to prior tracks. If we look at the details carefully, there are a lot of similarities. Um, this uh, rather distinctive furrow, the toe um, configuration actually matches up quite well. Mayanzinski remains skeptical that any of them are from a Sasquatch. All these tracks seem to me to fit into proportionally into a human description. What leads you to believe that these are something other than human? Well. It's just the fact of where I'm finding them. They're much more remote, maybe three hours in, maybe about a 2,000 foot elevation gain into some of these back areas. Have you found some in climates where people wouldn't normally be walking barefoot? Yeah, actually it was this one here. This was taken in 3 December, it was along a lake. There was some snow along the side and it was a chilly day that day. I've also found them along areas where they've stepped on burrs and sharp rocks. Meldrum compares Avalos' smaller casts with some from his own collection that are thought to be adult Sasquatch tracks. 
So let me show you some of the examples of uh, what we would say are typical Sasquatch tracks. The first thing that, that is impressive is the size. And so the average Sasquatch track would measure uh, around 16 inches. Relatively flat foot and, and an exceptionally broad heel. We mentioned the, the flatness, and that indicates that there's a lack of a longitudinal arch. These tracks uh, do exhibit an arch. This one is an excellent example, a very well-developed and well-expressed arch. While the arch is a hallmark of a human track, it does not rule out other possibilities. Meldrum has studied more than 200 track casts, but he's seen few that are small enough to be those of juveniles. That has raised the question of what would a juvenile Sasquatch uh, track look like? Uh, could it have a more human appearance and only take on these characteristics of an adult Sasquatch as they achieve their gigantic proportions? Professional tracker Fernando Morera has also examined the evidence, but can't say for sure if they are something other than human. I don't have enough evidence to turn on. We said if it was real or not real. He would need more than these isolated prints to make a final determination. A good track can always have to have a open mind and everything. Could be real, possibility. Could be fake, maybe. We don't know until we find enough evidence. I hope later along in the future that to be able to find something and be able to follow all the way to the end. If I could follow all the way to the end of it, I should be able to figure out the mystery. The analysis of the video evidence is complete. By overlaying the original video and still photos taken at Mono Lake, the horizon and rock formations are a perfect match. We've got the spot, we've got the location. We use photogrammetry to calculate heights of anything based on object of known dimension within a scene. Unfortunately, Weathering of the Tufa Formation has made the Mono Lake measurements difficult to use. Based on the comparison of the video and what's currently there, I prepared another exhibit. The lines show approximately where the water line is today. The creature is below the water level, which would mean less than, than seven feet. The seven-foot rise in the water level would be roughly one foot above the creature's head. So the conclusion is the creature is maybe six to eight feet. And that's about as close as we can calculate given the data we've got to work with. MonsterQuest has made some exciting discoveries during this investigation. The expedition team determined that the area where the Sasquatch has been sighted could support a group of large primates. Deer, fish, and high-protein vegetation would be sufficient to support a large primate even during the winter months. While they were not able to determine what it was, the science team has concluded that the creature captured in the Mono Lake video is between six and eight feet tall. And the team was able to locate one track that matches those Jaime Avalos documented in the area. And what I saw that day did not match my understanding of what a human looks like. And I really don't think they want any um, interaction with human beings, if they do, they'll let you know. These kinds of observations, in reality, lend greater credibility. This isn't just a, a, a singular monster out there in the wild. We don't know it all, and there are still mysteries out there. And I think that's what keeps a lot of people going in this world, is to go out there and find out what's behind that next hill. There's a terrifying beast prowling Kentucky swamps and backwoods. There's something out here. The creature has an appetite for flesh. And it's seeking all kinds of prey. And then I felt something hit my van. Kind of looks like it would be a canine. And now evidence may finally reveal. I've never caught an image like that on any of my other cameras. 
the existence of the hillbilly beast. Did you hear that? Something just threw a rock in the river in my direction. I can't believe it. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. <laughs> Kentucky is hill country. This part of the country is famous for its small town hospitality and horse farms. The Ohio River in the north and the Tennessee to the south form natural borders around the state's lush natural forests. But something strange may also be lurking in these woods. When we looked over there, there was a, a big dark colored creature standing across the slough. It wasn't walking on our fours. It was walking upright. The hair was long, a foot long, all over it, from top to bottom. They were big eyes. That The head had to have been bigger. Eyewitnesses report seeing a dark, hairy creature, 8 to 10 feet tall and weighing up to 800 pounds. It is said to be covered with matted brown fur and his eyes that appear black in the day and yellow-orange in darkness. The creature is also said to let out piercing shrieks and howls at night. Kentucky's lush vegetation and secluded waterways provide an ideal home for deer and other animals thought to be the beast's primary prey. Well, we decided one night that we were just gonna get out of the house and we were gonna go parking. Mm -hmm. Amy and John Long were engaged to be married. After pulling over on a secluded country road, they suddenly realized they were not alone. We sat there and it was real quiet and we had the windows down on the truck and you could hear something breathing. I leaned my head out the window and I heard a noise and it just started going. Rrr, rrr, rrr. The couple had lived in the area all of their lives but they had never heard an animal sound like this one. And I told my fiance at the time, I said, there's something out here. And it kept getting closer and closer. And he said, let's get out of here. John threw the truck into gear and began to drive away when he heard the sound again. He slowed and shined a flashlight in the direction of the noise. We went on around the road a little ways and seen some deer and we were spotlighting the deer and we spotted something off the edge of the woods. they'll never forget what they saw. It was huge. It had long hair-like substance on it. It was pretty good size, walking on its back legs. Had a weird color eye, the eyes glowed in the dark, a real strange orangey color. And it appeared to be maybe seven foot tall and real long shaggy hair it looked at us and it would look away and look at us again and it would look away and then it focused on the deer john and amy believe the creature was closing in on a kill i think it caught one because we as we pulled up to the other little creek that we were at you could hear a deer just hollering just you know blah like it had been caught mm. Stories about the beast have circulated in this area for decades, and numerous witnesses have recently come forward. Tim Farmer works with Kentucky's Department of Fish and Wildlife and is skeptical that such a creature exists. I have people that call with sincere sightings of things that they think they have seen, and I would never, ever, in a million years, call somebody a liar. I would disagree with some of the sightings. Farmer thinks the sightings are an instance of misidentification of black bears. These mammoth creatures were only recently confirmed to exist in Kentucky. Now, some of these bears get pretty big. They can stand up. You know, when they stand up, they look huge. And there are variations of color. Uh, a bear can have a cinnamon color. Um, so they can, be, they can be a brown, they can be a black, but all variations of the black bear. 
Farmer believes the sheer number of hunters active in the state makes it unlikely an unknown creature could remain undetected. For the hunter who's out there and who really wants to see what's going on in the woods, he has a trail cam. There are thousands, probably tens of thousands of these in Kentucky. Now, this is a motion sensor camera, basically. And it's set to go off however many times and take as many pictures as you want. And my thinking is if there's anything out there that we didn't know about with these thousands and thousands of cameras out there, surely, surely, you would think that it's something like that would set one of those trail cameras off. But camera traps may have captured something that cannot be explained. This image, taken in September 2009, shows a mystery creature lurking in a garden outside of Louisville, Kentucky, just miles from where recent witnesses have sighted the beast. It is in this area, close to where the image was taken, that the expedition team will begin their search. They'll make their campsite near Henderson, Kentucky, on the banks of the Ohio River. They'll begin their investigation by interviewing eyewitnesses. This place has a long history of creature activity that stretches back for decades. And I think if we just concentrate our search around this area here and work our way out, we might you know, find some trace evidence and just go from there. When I get to a spot, what I'd like to do is get there a few days in advance if possible. Mark Peterson, a professional animal tracker, will lead the expedition. And go out and locate natural travel corridors, uh, pathways, trackways, things like that, and look for animal sign, food source, and water source. Predators the size of the hillbilly bees tend to hunt at night. So Peterson has brought two cameras that the team will mount in the woods to allow for a night observation of the area. They'll also scour the woods on foot to search for physical evidence of the creature. The presence of deer tracks indicates the team has found a possible hunting ground for the beast. The dew tracks on a buck are very low to the ground. They're right on top of the hoof. Whereas on a doe, if you look at any of these, here, um, you won't see the dew claw, even in the mud. To get the search started, they will deploy an infrared camera attached to a miniature helicopter. Once in the sky, the remote system will alert the team to the presence of any large animals. The survey will help them narrow their search area. With the helicopters, we can get up to about 400 feet of altitude, moving around an area of about an acre to look for whatever's out there. The camera will transmit images wirelessly to a monitor on the ground. Control check. All looks good, we're fired up. Give me a look left toward the tree line. Yeah, you're way you know, down there. Yeah, watch the trees too. Yep. You can set it down anytime you want right now. The team believes the beast is nocturnal, so they'll wait for dark before searching. We're in an area that has a, a lot of creature activity and it's been going on for a long time. And it's, uh, it's, it's just a really creepy area, especially at night. They launched the mounted camera in a wetlands area outside Geneva, Kentucky. Ready, Greg? Yep, we're going. Okay. Good both directions on the road. All right, we're going across. Okay, maintain that pipe going across. 
Okay. The red tones show heat and can indicate life forms on the ground. Alright, I'm paying left. The helicopter makes wide sweeps, covering an area that would take days to search on foot. All right, I'm gonna bring it back. Peterson is convinced they are in the right area. Down in this area, there sure are a lot of people that have stories of sightings, um, which is pretty interesting because it sure is a whole lot of folks down here that keep seeing something. How could it not exist? Quest has traveled to Kentucky, searching for the hillbilly beast thought to be stalking the local woods. The legends about the creature's existence go back centuries. Many are linked to frontiersman Daniel Boone, who helped settle Kentucky. Boone told a biographer about killing a 10-foot hairy beast, he referred to as a yahoo. Boone took the reference from his favorite book, the 1726 novel Gulliver's Travels. He believed the creature resembled those in the book. We call them the old people of the forest. Uh, they were here long before we were. Michael Manfox Bully is Cherokee, one of the many tribes that lived near this area. Still in this hill somewhere. The Cherokee legend about a frighteningly large creature has been passed down for generations. My grandfather told me a story about his father having two prize hogs, and uh, I assume they weighed 250 pounds each, probably, and uh, this creature came in, grabbed both of the hogs, one under each arm. It had a, had a wood fence, rail fence around the, the hogs, stepped over the fence with both hogs under each arm, and ran off into the woods. They're big, hairy, uh, probably eight feet tall. They use the creeks and the waterways for their pathways to get places. That's why you don't find a lot of their footprints. The recent eyewitness reports match the legends, but evidence of the beast has been elusive until now. I've been putting cameras out now for probably 10 years. Okay. In 2009, Kenny Mahoney, an avid hunter, set up some of the trail cameras he uses to track deer and other game. I have a razor garden and uh, wildlife eats quite a bit of it, so I put out camera to see uh, patterns, see what's coming through the garden. He never expected to see something like this. Everything's I've caught on my camera has been pretty, pretty explainable. You know, uh, and that, that photograph's actually got two objects on it that I can't, can't explain. In addition to the unidentified image in the center, there's a similar but smaller image to the left. So many people look at it and see something different. I mean, I, I just like to see, it, it made me feel a lot better to, to rule some things out. With anything. What do you grow back here? The science team will analyze the image. Peter Schmitz, a photo analyst, is conducting field experiments to determine the size and scale of the mysterious creature. In this situation, we're taking a known photograph and we're trying to determine the physical size of whatever the creature or target is. Schmitz stages a control photo at the same location. By manipulating the elements within the photo, he will try to determine the size of the creatures shown in the original. And by doing that, I can actually transpose the images over the top of each other and see and, and use that as a comparison uh, for physical size. Ideally, if we can have the exact same camera in the exact same position as soon after the original photo was taken, taken at the same time of the day after the photo is taken outside so we can duplicate lighting conditions, Less than two weeks have elapsed since the original photo was taken. Conditions for replicating the image are ideal. What are we looking at, about 35 yards to the, uh, to the spot where the 
where the creature was. What we're probably going to want to do is put a put a something of a known size over there, maybe a person. The, the game cam here. Mahoney's son, Kenny Jr., will stand in the area where the image was captured. Go ahead and get her set up, and we'll get a manual shot of him when he gets over there. Can you open up the tape measure to three feet? Get it so we can see it. Hold your hand on either side of that three-foot length. Smith will return to his lab to compare the original image with the control photo. The team will determine the size of what was captured in the field of view and whether it is too large to be any known animal. The expedition team is investigating the strange cries the creature makes at night. I've heard it kind of like make a howling noise. I've heard bobcats howling. It's nothing like a bobcat. Nothing comes close to what this was. Those who've heard these cries claim they are unlike any known wildlife species. You have a wide variety, everything from howls to screams to whoops to growls. The team is outside of Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, where a number of witnesses have reported hearing the beast. They will use a geophone to amplify sounds and movements. Oh yeah, this is wonderful. This is the probe on it simply inserts into the ground and it will pick up vibrations uh, such as those produced by a large animal. The microphones and recording devices are synchronized and positioned in two locations to maximize audio coverage. This looks like a good place, eh? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty stable. It's above the ground. These devices can also detect infrasound. Well, infrasound is sound that is basically defined as something that is below the range of audio or auditory perception of humans. There is evidence that large predators like lions and tigers use infrasound to communicate with each other. While infrasound is not audible to humans, the sounds are known to distress and disorient prey. It can cause organs to move and vibrate, your eyeballs to move and vibrate, and it can actually be physically and uh, health-wise diminishing and bad for humans. Fox believes the hillbilly beast could have the capability to produce infrasound and disorient potential prey. The expedition team has recruited local guides to take them into swamps deep in the backwoods. Many of the eyewitnesses claim to have encountered the monster near water. And obviously we're, we're on the Ohio River, and animals by nature are lazy. They always take the path of least resistance. So rivers are, are natural travel corridors for any large-bodied animal. All right, let's get going. Most of these logs is real difficult to see, so you tend to just run up on them and get stuck. Wow, this thing just goes forever, doesn't it? Yeah. You get a lot of uh, reported sightings of creatures down in these cypress swamps, don't you? Um, yeah, and you know, it's a, it's certainly a, a great place, I think, for, for wildlife to, to hide out. Not a lot of people uh, come out here. You know, these swamps aren't places that people typically um, long to be unless they grew up around them or something. It's very inaccessible back here, isn't it? It's extremely remote. Yeah. This is some spooky stuff, I'll tell you. Yeah, like it, it is. It. 
Munster Quest is combing Kentucky's backwoods for the hillbilly beast, a seven-foot, flesh-eating monster. The expedition team is near Geneva, Kentucky. Fresh evidence suggests that many of the encounters have occurred on or near the area's many rivers and streams. And then I felt something hit my van and knock it. Bob Ganyard is an avid boater. And when a new boat ramp opened up along the Mississippi River, he and a buddy were eager to check it out. So we went down into the bottoms to go down and look at this boat ramp. And it was a big, concrete, huge slab, nice ramp, but out in the middle of nowhere. When Ganyard attempted to leave, his van ended up stuck in the mud. I backed out on the road the best I could see it and started to head away from the ramp, and I got off the tracks. I just happened to slide to the right, and it sucked me right in, and left my van sitting at an angle. The van needed a tow, so his friend went to get help while Ganyard stayed with the vehicle. I've got the windows down, the back windows uh, opened up, and uh, had the dash lights on, just in case anybody else went in a four by four or something come flying down the trail. And then I felt something hit my van. Boom, and knocked it. And the van started rocking. And each time it went a little bit farther. And I got to the point where I had my feet on the passenger door, and I'm leaning straight up. <laughs> Ganyard caught a glimpse of a powerful, beastly creature. I saw a reflection in, in the window, just for a second. But it looked like two big brown eyes. And this sucker was, whatever it was, was looking down at me. And I'm yelling, and I'm looking up at him, he's looking down at me, we're that far apart. And I'm cussing and swearing and yelling and screaming. And after I'm screaming and yelling and everything else, it dropped me. And I came, boom, I thought I was going over. The attack ended as quickly as it began. I didn't put the windows down, and I didn't get out. And I sat there about another 15, 20 minutes. The experience is one that still terrifies Ganyard. I was shaking. Uh, it scared the tar out of me. The expedition team is exploring the woods outside Hebbardsville, Kentucky. This is a gorgon. Where Michael Manfox Bewley recently discovered an unusual tooth. And literally right back here is where you found that tooth. Yes. I'm very curious to see what it is. I have my own idea. I believe it's one of these creatures, too. Sure. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to see what it is. What do you think about that, Mark? Well, because of the shape of this, um, it kind of looks like it would be a canine from something. Is that kind of what you think? I'm thinking it's a canine tooth, yeah. Peterson immediately notes something else. Canines never have a double root. Yeah, it was right. like a single root. So that uh, automatically tells me it's not a canine. Mm -hmm. um, it could be something like a premolar. Take it for granted. It's the a team canine. would like to do DNA right. testing right. on the tooth. Right. But Bully does not want to part with what he considers a sacred object. They decide to take high resolution photographs of the tooth for analysis. It will take solid proof to convince Tim Farmer that there are any unknown beasts in these woods. I've probably been in every county, been in the woods, in the deepest, darkest part of the woods, been in tree stands, and sat for hours, sat for 12, 13 hours in a day, and been able to see, you know, sometimes for a half a mile or better, and uh, have never seen anything like that. Farmer believes even the many reports of unidentified howls and shrieks have a logical explanation. There are so many odd sounds that different creatures make. Foxes make a huge amount of noise. 
Um, bobcats make a horrific noise in the woods. Coyotes can make the hair stand up on your neck, and they do a they do a range of vocalization for different times of year, whether it's whether they're breeding or or moving around looking for food. And there's only one time that I heard something. I didn't know what it was. I was on top of a mountain, and I heard the awfulest sound I've ever heard in my life. I ran off the top of that hill. And I don't know how I didn't kill myself going down the mountain, but it was a fox. There are so many critters out there making so many noises. It's, you know, some, some nights it, it really lights up out there. Outside Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, the expedition team is recording the sounds in these woods. The team hopes to capture the beast's vocalizations. They will try to elicit a response using both recordings of known animals and unidentified recordings collected by audio expert Joe Fox. The team will run a nighttime experiment using a technique known as call blasting. Call blasting involves transmitting a sound into the wilderness in order to provoke responses from creatures nearby. It's now about 10 o'clock at night and we're going to start with some call blasting. That's where we project pre-recorded sounds or vocalizations out at a higher than normal amplitude. Okay, we ready to go? Okay, now everybody be quiet. It's a dog. Yeah. The forest around them is active with animals. Has it been around? High frequency responses the team can't hear will be picked up by the recording devices. Well, I, I hear something. Yes, it's, it's to our south at about 10 to 11 o'clock. Do you hear that? Yeah. That high-pitched scream? Exactly. Monster Quest is in a remote cypress swamp deep in the Kentucky wilderness, tracking down proof of the hillbilly beast. When it stepped out of the trees, I sort of just jumped. Well, it did the same thing. Lynn Hutton took his eight-year-old son deer hunting along a trail not far from their home in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. I'd taken him along just uh, so he could see what it was like. The pair was in an area thick with cedar trees and trails, hoping to find deer. Deer like cedars for cover. And uh, so their path naturally will follow into cedar thickets a lot. Late in the day, father and son gathered their gear and headed home. Got close to being dark. Uh, I told him we better be getting back because we, it was quite, good little walk back to the truck. They were hiking home when they encountered the beast. Naturally, I wasn't expecting it to be there, and but when it stepped out, I don't believe the way it acted, I don't believe it expected us to be there. It just kind of shocked me. I looked at it, and he, I took my son, kind of pushed him to the back beside me. The encounter lasted only a few seconds, but in that short time, Hutton got a good look at a huge hulking beast. This thing was between seven and eight foot tall. It had long brown matted hair all over it. Its face was covered, its arms, body. The whole thing was just covered in this long matted brown hair. And I didn't know if we were, you know, if the thing was gonna attack. Hutton had a gun stashed in his coveralls. By the time I had thought to actually lay my bow down on the ground and unzip my coveralls and get my gun out, this thing stepped back into the cedar trees just like he stepped out. When the creature disappeared, Hutton and his son ran to their truck. 
he never reported his story to police. I wouldn't take anything for that minute or two, but at the same time, I don't want to do it again. <laughs> it was scary. It really was scary. I mean, it scared me really, really bad uh, to the point that I never went deer hunting on that farm again. Never. The expedition team is outside of Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, in an area where strange howls and calls have been reported. They have been call blasting unidentified sounds into the surrounding woods. These amplified calls, collected by the team's audio expert, Joe Fox, are the purported vocalizations of the beast. The team is waiting to record whatever might respond to these eerie recordings. Do you hear that? Yeah. That high-pitched scream? Exactly. They wait. The team has provoked a response from something very close. That's very high frequency. I think what we're hearing off to the side over there is a street cow. Very high frequency. But we did also simulate some other vocalizations. The team blasts the call several more times. The recorders will capture sounds inaudible to human ears. The following day, the team reviews the tapes. Last night, we made a number of projections out towards the river away from our base camp. The most interesting aspect, uh, I thought, last night was the responses we got from the call blasting. They have identified the calls of a number of common nocturnal predators. A screech owl, a dog, a coyote. But there are also sounds they cannot identify. Those will have to be analyzed back at the lab. Joe Fox scouts by the river. It is here where most of last night's unidentified responses seem to emanate. Did you hear that? Something seems to be moving towards Fox. Something just whacked a tree on the other side of the river from me and then threw a rock in the river in my direction. I can't believe it, but it just happened. Monster Quest is in Kentucky hunting for the truth behind repeated sightings of the hillbilly beast. This couple saw the creature and then heard the cries of a deer that it may have attacked. This man may have photographed proof of the beast. This boater was waiting for a tow out of the mud when his van was violently attacked. And this scientist might have provoked the creature's aggression. It looked like a rock, and it looked like it was directed towards me. The expedition team has received a response they did not anticipate. Something is moving near the river, and an object hurled in the direction of Joe Fox has him on edge. The rest of the team heads to Fox's location. The team searches the woods as the daylight hours slip away. They can find no sign of the creature, but something seems to be on the move, and it is agitating a pack of nearby coyotes. 
I have to admit that when um, I uh, turned around and I saw that uh, rock being thrown in my direction from the other side of the river, it, it, it really sort of frightened me because um, uh, it's something that I'd never experienced before. I would like to have at least a fragment of the jawbone so that uh, you have some idea of where the tooth was positioned. Dr. Graham Hickman has received the photo of the tooth provided by the expedition team. He has compared it to known mammals in the area and notes some unusual features. The thing that struck me was the fluting um, on the tooth. The upper part of the enamel has these striations and uh, I'm not particularly familiar with those. That doesn't mean that it's not a common feature, it's just that I haven't come across it in my travels. And, um, you know, I've worked with African mammals and North American mammals. Without the actual tooth, Hickman cannot identify the creature. Anything unknown is intriguing. Uh, I think we all like to have answers for things. But I think we have to remember also that uh, sometimes it takes a little more time to get an answer, and it's better than rushing to judgment. The Kentucky Field audio recordings are being analyzed at Texas A&M University. The process involves listening to each tape, making files of the sounds, and analyzing them with computers. The team makes a startling discovery. There were a number of vocalizations that we listened to and that we re recorded at the site that didn't really fit into any categories. We identified probably 15, 16 known species in the vocalizations. But on top of that, we had another 20 or 30 that we had no idea what they were. All animals have a range of fundamental frequencies in their vocalizations. In the full context of... Uh, and this is around 300... While in the field, the team heard coyotes stirring. Now they learn that a mysterious howl set off the pack. The interesting thing about these coyote vocalizations is that some of them were preceded by some of these unknown uh, vocalizations that we heard, uh, which were unlike the coyote vocalizations themselves. You hear that call? And we're getting some howls as well. Yeah. There's our ubiquitous uh, coyote pack. Here's what we think is a pre-howl that sets off these subsequent vocalizations with the coyotes. There seemed to be a trigger causing the coyotes to start their howling, and it was a howl of short duration that was at much lower frequency. It's definitely a larger animal than a coyote. We can draw some conclusions, and, and they're not precise conclusions, in that there are some unknown vocalizations out there, and uh, it just calls for the need for more investigations like this to bring into context what we might be hearing. Wildlife expert Mark Peterson has retrieved trail cams. The camera's sensors were triggered. Photos have been taken. We've got two sets of trail cams um, that we'll look at now. Um, the first set, we've got four photos. Uh, the weather has been terrible out here. So we didn't do a lot on our trail cams. We got a couple of deer um, that's coming down that draw. The deer are thought to be a food source for the creature. Coyote, coyote. How many people do you think you talk to a year that claim to see something on average? Well, on average, about 15 or 20 a year 15, throughout the state. 
the shot of what appears to be the... Image Sasquatch. expert Peter Schmitz has analyzed the photo of the strange creature taken by Kentucky man in the fall of 2009. I immediately started looking at what else was in the image besides the perceived creature. I look at things such as corn that was growing in front of the creature. Based on the corn stalks, uh, I estimated the, the creature to be fairly large and that possibly three feet across uh, shoulders, um, height-wise, uh, six plus feet. To compare, Schmitz took a control photo in the same location as the original. The calibration photo uses a tape measure to determine width and distance in the original. I can now go in and actually measure from shoulder to shoulder with my calibration file already in place. You know, anywhere from two to two and a half feet. After further investigation and, and really studying the image closer, along with several other photos that were taken from the same game camera, there were other images that popped up that suddenly started to make sense. What we learned was that the target that we thought was at a greater distance from the camera was far closer, much closer, probably within 10 yards of where the camera was located. So now once we've determined that, we suddenly realize it's not the large creature that we thought it was, it's, it's a bird. Here you've got the wings wrapped around the body as it's coming down in its downward stroke, if you will. You can see the feathers in the, the leading edge of the wing here. You can see the tail feathers in the back controlling his, his, his landing. For the man who took the photo, Schmitz's scientific analysis doesn't solve the mystery of the beast. You know, just acres and acres of wilderness that, you know, people just really are scratching their surface on. And I don't, I don't believe that it's out of the question for something to be back there that we, that we don't know about. The expedition has turned up some interesting results. The unidentified tooth indicates that unknown creatures could be prowling Kentucky's woods and wetlands. The analysis of the trail cam photo is likely that of a bird landing, but the other shape remains unidentified. And the call blast recording suggests that there is an unknown beast lurking in these woods. What you hear with the human ear may not sound like much, but once you start recording it at the level we were, even if you think you're out in the wilderness, you're not living in a quiet world. If this creature does exist, it's not difficult for me to believe that it's been undiscovered. Uh, and they're discovering new creatures all the time. I think this creature, whatever it is, I think it's a little bit more intelligent than everybody puts off because it, it watches you and it, if it's gone this long without, you know, being seen very much, just as rare glimpses of it and, and sounds of it, then, I mean, it's, it's got some kind of intelligence.